All right, Mandy Majors, it is so good to have you back on the program. How are you doing? Good. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I was, I forgot to even look up the last time we've had, because we've had you on a few times, but if I probably did look it up, I'd be amazed at how long it's actually been, because time seems to be at warp speed nowadays, and you were just telling about uh, your daughter that's uh, coming up on graduation, and so things have changed a lot in our lives from however long ago it was that we first met. I'm telling you, it it's crazy how time flies. Um, you know, my whole ministry started when my daughter was in fourth grade and was exposed to porn. There were no phones present, but there was a lot of talk about what had been watched the night before. And she was nine. She didn't have a phone. She was fourth grade. And now she is 18. So uh, she's getting ready to graduate from college and, uh, uh, sorry, graduate from high school and move to college. And it's a whole new, whole new thing, Jonathan. I need your wisdom here. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, we're actually going to, I'm interviewing you. So uh, I, I guess we can't go, <laughs> we can't go both ways, but I really want to talk about this, uh, this book that you've, um, you've published that's called Keeping Kids Safe in a Digital World, A Solution That Works. Um, I think even just with that title, there's going to be a lot of parents that are interested to hear what you have to say and what you've outlined in that book. So first of all, just tell us um, why you wrote the book and kind of, you know, what led up to that? Well, you know, this whole journey started in 2013. Again, my daughter was nine um, and I just realized we were missing something as Christian parents. You know, my whole goal was you're not getting a phone till you're 30. I don't have to deal with all this stuff. And that's it. Right. Well, that didn't work. <laughs> she was still exposed to porn. I realized early on that I could delay the phone as long as I wanted, but I couldn't delay the conversations. Like mm. I had to get in there. So, uh, you know, we formed next talk. I started writing and speaking and quite frankly, my, presentation was our story and then it would be 10 takeaway talking points like this is what you can do right now in your home to keep your kids a little bit more safe and um, as that evolved a lot of moms would come to the events and they would say my husband didn't want to come or whatever and so do you have this in written form so that's kind of how keeping kids safe evolved. It is my presentation that I give at churches and Christian schools predominantly around the country. And it's in written form. So if you want to have me speak, if you want to know what we're about, but it really summarizes I, I, what I try and do. And I, I worked with my editor a lot on this. My goal for this book was somebody could read it in three hours or less because mm. we're busy, right? And this issue is very complicated. And so I really wanted to try and simplify what I was learning, but have a lot of meat for the takeaways. Um, and so I broke it down into three chapters. It's like um, the new problem we face, like what we're up against, how has culture changed, and then a solution that works, and then 10 practical things that you can do right now to implement that solution in your home. And so that's kind of the structure of the book and how it evolved. Yeah. Now, with a title like that, I would assume that a lot of parents would th immediately go to this thought. So this is a book about all the digital tools that are going to lock down my kids' phones and how to deal with an iPhone or, you know, all of that. That's not what it is, though, right? So... So why, Absolutely. first of all, first of all, why do you think it, that's our first inclination as parents is lockdown? How do we lock down devices? And, and especially when we start to talk about digital world, we immediately go to devices. Why do you think that's not the best place to start in what you're trying to help parents engage? Yeah, I love that you bring this up because a lot of times at events when I'm presenting this material, they'll be like, man, I thought you were going to tell me 10 apps to stay away from and how to do my Wi-Fi router and all the things, right? And all those things are good. Those are all tools in your tool belt. You know, uh, parental restrictions are good. Uh, screen time. Apple has great screen time settings that you can implement. All of those things are wonderful, like random phone checks. You know, I advocate for all of those. But restrictions are great. I mean, it's really about the relationship, though. Let's mm. be honest here. And I think as Christian parents, what happens is we see our kids being overexposed and we want to go into lockdown mode. And that's why our first reaction is give me all the, you know, I'll pay $100 a month 
if you can just protect my kid and send me a report. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying those things are bad. They're tools. But many times they're a false sense of security. And what I mean by that is if your kid knows that you're monitoring their phone and they want to hide something from you, they're going to go to school or youth group and they're going to get on their friend's phone and create a new Instagram account. Mm. So you may be monitoring the Instagram account that says John 316, I love Jesus, but you're not monitoring the Instagram account where they're putting all the horrible photos, right? And so they're keeping that account completely separate from you. And so you can have everything installed on your kid's device, and there's still loopholes in this digital world. I think you just uh, may have caused some serious heartburn in some <laughs> parents when you just revealed to them that their kids may be deceiving them about their online behavior. And I've seen a study, and you, you probably know even more of this information than I do. Uh, I've seen a study that has said that you know 70% of online behavior kids are hiding from their parents. And it may be higher than that even now. But um, so, so let's talk about this. If there's this disconnect where lockdown is not the best method, while all these tools and creating fences and boundaries, those are good things. But why does that not actually produce the outcome that most parents want in terms of their kids not engaging certain you know, media or certain messages? Well, I think, you know, for me as a mom, I had to move from helicopter parenting to understanding my kid and the culture they're growing up in and really being a good listener to what mm. they were feeling, what their friends were feeling, what they were hearing online and their opinions about that. Um, and then, you know, after taking that all in, being able to point them th to Jesus and go to scripture and try and help them figure out where do you fall on all this? Because this is what God says, and this is what culture says. Um, but we do, you know, the bubble wrapping, it's something that I've had to learn to get away from. Um, you know, I, and, and I'm so glad I did. I mean, now I'm saying the best thing that ever happened to our family was my kid being exposed to porn in the fourth grade. You want to know why? Because I'm sending my kid to college in a couple months, and I, she's ready for the world. Like, there's not one subject we haven't tackled as a family and dug into the Bible. There's not one that I can think of. You know, she's ready. And I'm so glad I got out of that bubble wrap mentality. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the, 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 the risk, uh, the, the courage that's needed for a parent to step into that. Because I can, even, I can just even imagine parents that are listening to this right now, first of all, I would imagine their first question is, where do I even start? Like, how do I even start? Because maybe maybe for the parents out there that they haven't had any of these conversations that go below a certain line of transparency or vulnerability, um, let's take just the issue of porn that you're talking about. Talk to the parent out there of, of where do they begin if they have never even had this conversation with their child, specifically using words like pornography and, and those kind of things. Okay, well, there's a lot to unpack here, a lot that I want to say to this question. First of all, you know, when I found myself in this same dilemma of, oh, no, app monitoring tools are good, but they're not going to get everything what do I do? Like we, we talked about moving to a, an island with no Wi-Fi. I mean, you know, we, we covered all the bases. But one day I was reading scripture and, and God was so sweet because I, I kept thinking, what is the solution? Like, what is the solution to this huge problem we're facing? And I, for me, I just, I needed that answer. Um, and God led me to Deuteronomy 6, 6, and 7. And that's kind of the solution that I present in my book and if you're not familiar with that scripture, I'll summarize it for you. It says, teach your kids these commands that I'm giving you. Talk on the go, uh, when you're at home, when you're getting up, and when you're going to bed. That's four key times to talk with our kids. And when I read that scripture, when it said on the go, I just thought, oh my gosh, this is the solution because I have learned that my kids were more likely to ask awkward questions and say words like porn and sex in the car when it's just one on, you know, when it's just me and the child. 
And I guess it's because they didn't have to look at me directly. And so it was a little bit less weird for them. Right. And so when I saw on the go, I knew that was the solution that I had been looking for. And I really felt like God was saying to me, Mandy, like I need a new culture in your home. I want it to be one of open communication, a healthy dialogue. Nothing can be off limits. If they start talking about pornography at the kitchen, you know, at dinner time, we're going to have this conversation. And so I will tell you, I was on board with that from day one. Like, I'm going to do this because it, it, to me, it was like God presenting a solution to me. Mandy, have the courage to do it. My husband, however, when I told him, he was not on board. He was like, what? We've got it. At this time, we had a fourth grader and a kindergartner. And he was like, I, I am not talking about sexual reform with our kindergartner. Like, I don't, we can't overexpose them, right? And so we started on this journey to try and figure it out. And and the thing that I've learned is I think often we limit the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that, we think it's cliche, but I'm telling you, there have been moments in my parenting where old Mandy would have responded an entirely different way. I would have been helicoptering, bringing it down, you know, bringing the hammer down And in those moments when I've been intentional about, Lord, help me create a new culture of conversation in our home, it's like he stops me and I respond a new way, a new way that creates new conversation. Um, And so it's just been a crazy journey. Um, The first thing that you asked there, though, was where, what is step one? What would I do the first thing? And I'll tell you, you know, nine years ago when... I found the solution and I was like, okay, I'm going to start this process. I didn't know where to start either. I was like, do I just bring up the word porn and sex to my fourth grader? Like how, how do I approach this? Right. Again, the Holy spirit, I felt like God was saying to me one night, I need you to crawl in bed with your kid and I need you to ask her this question. And, and again, Deuteronomy six, six and seven talk when you're going to bed. Right. So I crawled in bed with her, scratching her back. And this is what I asked her. How, can I be a better mom to you? That was the question. How can I be a better mom? And honestly, what she said really stung. She said, mom, you're not a good listener. Mm. So you can imagine. And I wanted to get defensive. You know, I wanted to say, you don't, you don't know what it's like to be an adult. You don't know what it's like to have all these responsibilities, but I didn't. I zipped it. And and I said to her, like, I am, I'm so sorry. Like, I want to be a good listener. I have a lot going on. This is something I'm going to work on. And, and I asked her to hold me accountable. And she has. That's been a cool kind of little journey. When we first started, she would give me report cards with stickers and stuff and tell me how I was doing. But um, last year, you know, she was 16, 17 last year at this time. And um, she wrote me a card for my birthday. And it said, you're such a good listener. Mm. And it was, it, was just, I, it was just a moment where all these years I've been trying to be a better listener. And it finally clicked with her that I did that to be a better mom so that she would feel comfortable telling me things. There's a couple of things that you're saying that I think are really important to highlight. Um, because, you know, we started this conversation with this title from your book about keeping kids you know, safe in a digital world. And I think our first inclination as parents is we go to the mechanical around what that looks like. What I love what you're talking about is you're talking about the relational, but on two different planes. You've mentioned the Holy Spirit a few times, and I want you to talk a little bit about why it's so important for parents to understand that there's nothing that they could ever talk with their child about that the Holy Spirit is not already aware of and wants to de- wants to deal with. And number two, just the idea that you went on a journey to build a relationship, and it's from that relationship that you've actually prepared your child for adulthood. Can you talk a little bit about why that relational foundation, both with the Lord and developing that vulnerability with your child, is actually what is most important when talking about dealing with all the digital junk that can be happening in a kid's life well man there's so much to unpack there because you know when when i'm submitting to god and the holy spirit and allowing him to teach me 
one, the fear, yes, I get overwhelmed, but like you said, I always go back to this doesn't surprise God. His word has the answers. And there, there's a peace in that. There is a peace in knowing I'm not alone to try and figure this out in these conversations that are, that are a lot. I mean, let's just be honest. It's a lot today that we have to talk about. Um, and then the relational aspect with my kid. I mean, there's so much, so many benefits that I've seen. One of the cool things that, you know, I didn't have a plan here. I just, God said, here's a solution. I just went in. I didn't know what was going to happen. One of the cool things that I have seen come out of all of this is she sees me being vulnerable and um, humble enough to n admit when I'm wrong. And I'm seeing my kids do that. Mm. So when they do make a digital mistake or they do look at something online or they do post something that may not be okay, like I give it a minute before I, even I yell at them or I, you know, have a con or I bring it up to them. I see, I let the Lord work with that first. And so many times I, my kid has said, oh, I probably shouldn't have posted this or, oh, whatever. Now there have been times that I've had to bring it to their attention, but that relational aspect of holding each other accountable it has just been truly something and it's changed my marriage. It's changed my relationships with my friends. I'm learning so much about relationships and being intentional about them that I didn't even realize was part of this journey when I first started. Yeah. So let me ask you this, as you think about the book and, and it also, you know, you said it's, it was born out of just your, your talk really that you've given, what would you say, might be the most surprising thing that a person could come across maybe in the material that you give or like as you've talked and you've you've given this presentation numerous times what are some of the things that people go wow i didn't really expect that or or maybe even just resisted i don't know if i can do that what are some of the things that that you've seen in that regard well, there's a lot. I mean, we, I'm like a tornado and, and you, if you've read keeping kids safe, you know, um, we cut, co I cover a lot because I'm, I'm trying to paint this picture of what culture is like today for our kids and how we can have empathy for them in, in getting caught up in it sometimes or drowning in it and, you know, making sure we're understanding it all. So I cover, you know, grooming, sex trafficking, pornography, sexuality, gender, you know, all of those topics that we're dealing with today, nude photos, you know, suicide, depression, all of that. Um, a couple things I think surprise people the most. That is when we talk, you know, you said pornography, you know, like what if your kid, you asked me earlier, what if your kid um, has a phone and you've never talked about pornography or sex or anything like that? And my, my thing to parents is say the words. They're mm -hmm. exposed. If they have a phone, they're exposed, right? So, so say, hey, have you ever seen pornography? Has your friends ever showed you pornography? What do you know about sex? Like, rip the Band-Aid off. And I think sometimes when we say the words, it kind of gives them permission to be, okay, I can tell you about this. And I share some extreme stories in my book. And sometimes I'll even say to parents, share these stories with your kids because if they've had a phone long enough, they've probably seen this stuff and you can rip the bandaid off. So this is, this is one. Um, and, and a lot of times they won't tell us cause they want to protect us. You know, they, they're thinking, Oh mom, mom or dad, they're out of touch. They don't know they're, you know, they're good little Christian people and this would upset them. And so the more we can say, Oh, we know about this. Then it's like, Oh, okay. I can talk to mom about this. She does not, she does know what's going on. Right. So here's one of the stories that I share in my book, and I, I share it with permission, you know, can use it anonymously. Um, I had a mom contact me one time, and her daughter had um, come out to her as lesbian, and she's freaking out, and I was like, well, okay, breathe, sister, you know, breathe, mama, uh, you know, breathe, love your kid, like, I want you to love your kid, you know, make sure your kid feels loved and, um, and met in the moment, you know, just met in that moment. And then over the next couple weeks or months is however long it takes. Um, I want you to ask, why do you, why did you, why do you think you feel this way? When did you start feeling this way? You know, and you're just looking for context. Like when did these ideas start in your little mind? Because you're, you're needing to get context on why they're struggling. 
And fast forward several months, I stayed in touch with Mama. You know, we were emailing and, you know, all of that stuff. And um, fast forward a couple months, she contacted me and said, oh, my gosh, my daughter told me that she's been watching porn. And when she watches girl on boy porn, the girl is always mean to the or the boy is always mean to the girl. He's spitting on her. He's choking her. He's hitting her. Why would I ever want that? Mm. But when I watch girl on girl porn, it's softer and gentler. So like, that's what I want for my life. So one of the things I tell parents is, and I'm not saying that every kid that's questioning their sexuality, it's because of porn. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm not saying that, but I do know, and I'm seeing this on the front lines Kids are being exposed to porn and it's affecting their sexuality. It's mm-hmm. affecting ha- what their preference is. So again, this is an example of if you would have freaked out when your kid told you they're struggling with their sexuality and just started lecturing and, you know, preaching at them, you're never going to get to the root of when did you start feeling this way? Mm. And, and how did you start, you know, like you're, you just need some context so you can try and figure out what's going on with your kid. Again, it's a fruit of that relationship, you Mm -hmm. know, of really digging in and understanding what your kids are struggling with. So what are... I think that surprises some people. Yeah, I think I think you're right, uh, especially the whole rip the bandaid off kind of deal. You know, it's like that's that takes a moment of courage, you know, to do that. Um, What are some of the biggest takeaways that you hope parents will have from the book and from what you're trying to deliver there? Gosh, there's so many. Um, I think this relationship aspect is huge. Um, one of the things that and it's one of my first talking points is you cannot go into crazy parent mode. And what I mean by that is when my daughter had earned her first social media platform, and I say earned, you know, they don't turn a certain age and they automatically get social media. Your kid needs to earn this. It's like driving a car. They earn that trust that you're going to give them the keys and let them drive, right? So she had earned her first social media platform. And, you know, in this process, I had been praying every day, Lord, show me the teachable moments. Help me respond with your Holy Spirit and not how I used to respond. (laughs) And one day she brought her phone and her eyes were wide open and I knew something was big was about to happen. And she said to me, mom, I was scrolling on Instagram and -and so-and-so from church went to a wedding and they put hashtag wedding. And I clicked on that because I wanted to see pretty dresses because a hashtag is like a file. So in her mind, she's going to go see bridesmaid dresses, wedding dresses if she clicks that. Well, instead, what had popped up was pornography, and it was Mm -hmm. really bad pornography. It scarred me when I saw it. And I think old, I know old Mandy would have opened up the trash, thrown away the phone, and said, That's it. That's it. I tried to be cool, Insta Mom, but this is from the devil. So no more, you know, no more. And that's how I would have responded. And I didn't do that. I literally stopped in my tracks. I put the phone face down on the kitchen counter. I didn't want my son to come in and see. And I look at her and I say, I'm so proud of you. This is exactly what I want you to do. Satan wanted you to get curious and he wanted you to click on that and keep clicking and keep clicking. But you didn't. You knew to protect your heart and mind and you brought it to me immediately. So because... You're telling me you earn a new app today. So tell me what you want and you get more freedom. So I, I want to really kind of unpack this because in the moment, I didn't really know the impact that it would have, but it has been instrumental in building this relationship. Old Mandy created an environment where my kid would lie or hide it from me because they're going to lose the app or lose the phone. Now, I didn't realize I was doing that. In my mind, I just want to protect them from porn, right? So it's, again, it's that reaction of protect, protect, protect. And so, but I was creating this environment when it pops up, don't tell mom because I'm going to lose it. I'm going to lose the app or they're going to throw away the phone. 
New Mandy created an environment where I'm positively reinforcing when you tell me. So you tell me, you get more freedom because mm -hmm. I trust you more. Thank you so much for telling me, right? The other part of this is that night I reported all those images to Instagram and there were way more than my daughter had even seen. And so I was struggling in my mind what I had seen. And again, Deuteronomy six, six and seven says, talk when you're going to bed. Right. So I crawled in bed with her that night and she was probably seventh grade at this point. And I said, Hey, I'm, I'm struggling to get these images out of my mind. How are you feeling about that? Like, are you, are you doing okay? And, and Jonathan, I can't even tell you how much conversation that opened up mm -hmm. because then we got to talk about how looking at those kinds of pictures makes you look at people differently. Mm -hmm. And so you may be walking down the hallway at school and instead of seeing like an innocent person just walking and you know that they're intelligent or that they're kind, you're seeing physical stuff and your mind is going to places that God doesn't want it to go and how that's going to impact relationships and you know, I didn't get into future, how it would impact future sexual at that point. I didn't, we've covered that now, but that is going to protect my kid from looking at pornography way more than me screaming. Don't look at pornography. It's awful. And it's from Satan. Like that's just going to mm -hmm. add in rebellion because then you're curious, you know, yeah. but if I can dig in and explain the reason behind the rule, this is why we don't watch pornography. It corrupts us. It corrupts how we look at people. It objectifies people. It's not okay. That is going to mean then they're going to be a self-advocate. So when they're around it, when I'm not around, you know, their little mind doesn't go to mom or dad will kill me if I look at this. Their mind then goes to, is this good for my brain? Is mm -hmm. this good for my heart? Is this good for me? And that's what I want to equip my kids with. Yeah, you know, as you're saying this, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking you're basically outlining exactly what Scripture tells us is the difference between having a, uh, a law and performance-based orientation towards our lives and, and activities versus a grace-based relational foundation towards that. Because, um, you know, one leads to fear and control and deception and death. And the other one leads to life and hope and uh, intimacy. So talk a little bit. We've got a little bit of time left here. Uh, you've mentioned it a few times. Talk a little bit about the, the value and the necessity for parents to have a vulnerability with their children about their own story and how to do that in a wise way. Because I've seen parents do that in a poor way that creates a a really unhealthy enmeshment type situation with their kids. So how have you navigated that? And how do you teach parents to think of why is it important that they share their own story with their kids as they are growing up? I love this question. Um, again, it's going to look differently for everybody because everybody has a different story and, and you don't need to be afraid of this because the Lord will guide you on this. The Holy spirit. I used to freak out when I first started this journey, because I felt like God was saying to me, Mandy, you're going to have to reveal some things to your past, to your kids that you're not going to want to, or that you're ashamed of, and you don't want to go back there. And I really struggled with that a lot. I talked to mentors about it. And it was one of those things, like, I just have to have faith in God that he's going to equip me when the time comes. Uh, one thing that I've learned early on is I would plant seeds with my kids that I wasn't a great teenager. So I wouldn't give them any, you know, when they were little, I wouldn't give them any details or anything that would scar them for life. But I would say, you know, mom really struggled as a teenager. Mom didn't make the best decisions. Mom wasn't a great friend as a teenager. And so I, I wish I could go back. And so here's maybe how you can handle this friendship or whatever, you know, just find those teachable moments. And then as my kids got older, specifically my daughter, I mean, she's 18 now, so there's not much she doesn't, she doesn't, not anything, she doesn't really know about my past. There came a moment when it was time to give her a little bit more detail about how I had messed up and, you know, why I value um, marriage and sex and intimacy and God's design for it because I have experienced not that. And I have baggage from that and explaining to her 
you don't appreciate it as much as I do, but I don't want you to have to walk through what I walked through kind of thing. You know, it, again, explaining to her um, why I'm so passionate about talking to her about these things, why it's important. And I, I love what you said, Jonathan, about the, the law versus the grace, because I, I've seen this play over and over, not, in the re, not only in the relationships with my kids, but the relationship that I have with Jesus. And when I first started this journey, like I'm not a smart person. So I didn't, I didn't like in my mind say, I'm going to be more grace-based versus law-based. You know, I'm just trying to figure out how to keep my kids safe online and how to build a relationship with her. And so I didn't have that intention, but man, over and over again, it has reminded me that the forgiveness that I received and the grace that I've received was so different when I grew up in a generation that it was just the law. Don't mm-hmm. have sex. It's awful for you. And the shame that comes along with it if you do. And so I knew I wanted to shift that perspective, but how, how could I do it in a way that was showing my kids, this is what you want to wait for. This is mm-hmm. worth waiting for. And so, you know, painting the picture of them, of what biblical marriage and sex looks like and how it safe it is and how, you know, I mean, we would, as my kids got older, we would talk very specifically about, you know, I want you to think about this. You have a relationship with someone, you decide to have sex with them, you break up, then you get in another relationship and you have sex with them and then you break up and then you finally meet the, the one, right? And you get married And then you go to your marriage night and you're both bringing different experiences in there. But what if you could go to your marriage night with you and your spouse not having those experiences and figure it out together? Like what a bond, what a foundation for a marriage that you could enter something like that. And, and just like painting that picture for them of what you're waiting for instead of just don't do it. It's awful, you know? Mm -hmm. And again, those conversations happened out of my vulnerability to share my past and how I've messed up and how I didn't, you know, we grew up, we just signed the pledge and put on the purity ring and that's it. There were no conversations that went along with it. Right. And I'm not saying purity rings are bad, but I'm saying do the conversations with the purity ring, right? I think we were missing all the conversations. Yeah. And, and so, you know, that's where I really wanted to break the cycle with my mm-hmm. kids. I wanted that relationship to be front and center because I've seen that in my own life with, with Christ. You know, when I was a teenager, it was all rules to me. And until I felt forgiven and loved and accepted right where I was with the grace that's when I was experienced true freedom and, and true relationship with Christ. Mm-hmm. Well, Mandy, this has I been talk so all day. I can talk no, all day. This is great. <laughs> this is great. This has been so good. Um, the, the book is keeping kids safe in a digital world. The ministry is next talk. Um, tell people where they can go to get the book and just more information about what you guys are doing at next talk. Yeah, I'm on Amazon, so you can get the book from Amazon. Uh, you know, just type in Keeping Kids Safe, Mandy Majors. It should come up. I also have a book called Talk. It's an older book, um, but it, it, it has a topics list, so I dive into sexuality, transgender, sex, dating, all of that kind of stuff on, in that book. Um, you can find anything that's going on at Next Talk, nexttalk.org, and that's two Ts, so Next Talk, but it's all one word. And um, we have a podcast as well. Uh, weekly content, new content that we put out. We have a video study. We have, we work with um, licensed professional counselors. So if you are in the San Antonio area or in Texas and your kid needs counseling, but you can't afford it, we will help pay for that for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have partners. We have a, that's a whole program that we implemented at Next Talk. It's been a dream of ours for a long time and we finally did it in 2021. Um, had the funding to do that. So we got a lot of things happening. All of our support and our resources are on our website at nexttalk.org. Yeah. Well, Mandy, I always love connecting with you and just uh, seeing what God is doing through you. So thank you for doing this work and writing these books and uh, just really coming alongside parents in one of the most challenging, uh, but but uh, exciting and uh, blessed jobs that a person can have. And so thanks for being with us today and having the conversation. 
Thank you very much. And parents, don't be afraid. Like God's mm -hmm. got you. I, I promise he's not going to let you down. <laughs> yeah. Well, we are glad that you've been with us. Uh, we're going to put all that information in the show notes. And we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on the Pure Sex Radio program. So take care. Mm -hmm.